place. Thomas, or Thomas, I hope you said that correctly. And he it works full time and he also has a startup, but he started building it as a student. Now, you can imagine how hard that is going from a student into a full time job, but also having to juggle a startup on the side. Well, he's going to tell you a great story about it. So. All over to you. Thank you. Hello. Um, yeah, so I'm Tomas and I'm here to present to you uh, not only my company, but most importantly, my journey as a as a student that had a had a full time you know student was a full time student, and then I had to juggle my startup on the side, and and then later now I'm a full time uh, corporate employee, and I also juggle the startup on the side. Um, I hope this talk is uh, good for you if you're trying to start something, and uh, you know you're in this weird mix between. Uh, wanted to start something, but you also want your own sustainability. Um, so yeah, and whether you're in early careers or you know you just want a career change, hopefully you'll get some lessons. So patient zero, um, why? What, what am I talking about here? Like, who am? What is my company about? So basically, the company is founded in Portugal, and it's based on Portuguese market. Uh, we still guarantee some uh, per country reproducibility if we are successful enough in the future. But the main the main idea is that financial independence in Portugal is very uh, is is much worse than other countries, especially, especially countries in the north. Um, so I think the most striking fact that you can read there is that uh, the average Portuguese leaves parents' house at 28, and this is three years above the average in the UK. Uh, but it's also more striking than that because usually in the UK you go to university, you live outside your parents' house for three, four years, and even if your legal address uh, doesn't change until you're 25 you are much further away from from dependency as you are in Portugal. Um, so that's the whole mission about Tunil Inca is uh, providing financial independence to students, um, bringing this financial literacy to an earlier age and also trying to fix some systemic issues that we found in the um, in, in the whole government and whole port in, in Portugal, as you'll see in a, in a second. So here is just some stats for you. You know, you can see on the bottom a map that basically just says what I said about um, age of living in their parents' house, blue countries, no surprise, Southern Europeans don't like to stay in their parents' house. But if we if we dig a bit a bit further into why this is happening, is it's not because they like their parents more. It's just because there's no there's no financial independence as early as in the northern countries, and obviously this has very close ties with the economy. And on the, um, next to it, you can see. Um, a bar chart, which it's not very legible, but basically it it, it shows that the statistics of the, the amount of people that are students and work in Portugal is much lower than the most successful countries like uh, UK, Holland, the Germany. And so we want to bridge, bridge this gap, you know, because we I read a book a long time ago called Technical Technical Social, Social Engineering by by Cambridge Press, and it's a book that um, mentions that that shows how how technology and the absence of technology can shape your behavior. So, for example, you know, we all know the, the good old terms and conditions. You know, if uh, if you just have wanted to accept and you needed to, to carry on, you carry on with it um, and you don't really know what you're signing up for. And here I think it's more of the same thing. You know, if, if there's no tools to bridge the gap, if there's no tools to to make this happen, then it's not going to happen. Um, and also the most striking thing is that I was talking about is the systemic issues. So, you know, let's imagine that you're a 16 year old in Portugal. And uh, and you want to work a weekend, and you want to be, you want to work legally. You don't want to do it under the, you know, just in cash or illegally or in anything. So you you might risk losing your health insurance. You might you might you might risk um, losing your tax exemptions that you're supposed to use when you're uh, later when you actually to start full time. And I even know a case of a guy that uh, his father died, and he had these benefits from the government because his father died. And if he was going to start working during his studies, he was going to lose the benefits from his father which I think is completely crazy. So with this in mind, we we created the Unilinker. Unilinker um, has two main goals, you know, one which was the, the whole noble cause that you can that I've just talked about, which is connect them with benefit with financial benefits, connect students to, to financial benefits. And this is, is, is not only financial literacy, but it's also uh, jobs that are flexible enough for them to do during their during their um, studies. It's also uh, discounts. It's also 
talks, financial literacy, is uh, direct communication with unions. So basically an aggregator of benefits that can that looks to bridge this gap of uh, of age down. And uh, to, to make that happen, we created the other side of the same equation, which is allow them to capitalize on the student market, allow companies to, to capitalize on the student market. So we're basically creating uh, two goals in the middle, which is where where these this, this two things meet. And uh, we've been working on them for the past year. Uh, the company just turned a year now. And the main goals are build a platform, which I think is pretty obvious from everything I said, and change the law, which is something we, which I think is a, a bit unconventional for, for a startup. Uh, so why why are we trying to change the law? How far how far can we go with this? And um, I think for one, the the main point is that it is convenient. So uh, if this law changes, then we are opening the market of students, and that will uh, benefit of, of our platform. But it's also just because it's a very noble cause, and everything that you I've just presented to you is generally wrong, and we need to we need to you know we work. <laughs> I I just told you that I was a student, and now I'm not a student anymore. Uh, but it's also that change about you know you are you are someone who is passive in life or you know you're you are you're learning from lectures and now and you see other people making changes and now you're like okay i'm not i'm not a child anymore maybe i should try to make a change myself so from now onwards i'm just going to talk to you uh, about the main milestones or the main periods of time during the whole this last year and hopefully they will they will show you some lessons that can help you bring your projects up to life um whether regardless of the stage that you are in um okay sorry someone tried to come in okay uh and for okay so the first point is inception so okay we created a company and this is probably uh the point that a lot of people here are interested in which is like okay i am a student i i, I need to do this part-time and how can i do it you know if if, if, if i was start to start it later i would still do the same thing that i did uh, when i was a student because the pro the process can be re replicable when you are a full time employee. So there were two projects uh, in in Porto, which is where I'm from, and there were two pairs of people trying to do the same thing. We came to the conclusion that uh, you know there was no proof that any of us was going to do it successfully on their own. So we merged the project, and uh, two of them dropped out of the project. So we have these two founders, me and my co-founder Andre, which is in Portugal. Um, and yeah, and then we were like, okay, we have that vision of the slide I just presented to you. How can I bring that to life? And uh, and I guess the, ma the main the main way to do it is to build a company, like actually set up a company. So we set up the basics, you know, operations, financial, product, marketing, and legal. Uh, secure the small funding, and you know the team grew a bit. Um, and the devil, can I? What's happening? OK, and the devil is in the details. This is the first conclusion that I reached, uh, because when you are when you are a student, when you are even in some corporate uh, corporate jobs, you don't really know, don't need to understand all details of your project, of your enterprise. But you want, when you are starting something, you really need to to go to the nitty gritty details of everything you do. So, for example, I was talking about uh, the basics, so operations, so like how the, how are we running day to day? So we 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 have shared equity between four partners, and then we have one person hired full time, and that and that full time hire came from funding. How did we get the funding? The funding came from well, I guess there's two ways of getting funding: it's the informal way and the formal way. You can go the V the VC route, uh, which will probably get you more capital, but uh, you you're probably also gonna abdicate of some more benefits for yourself, and uh, you know maybe that who knows. And uh, and you have the informal way, which gives you less capital, uh, but gives you a gives you an early start as well. And you know maybe you can do a bit of validation with that. And that's what we did. You know we we found a company of an acquaintance that was willing willing to give us a small a small investment of 10k. And that's what we did for the past year. It was enough for us to get started. And uh, and now we are profitable, uh, just ramen profitable, which is a concept from a Y Combinator. Uh, found no, not founder, but one of, one of the big guys called Paul Graham, and basically there's this concept that you know for for running a startup you need to get to ram, ramen profitable enough to pay the ramen every day, every at the end of each month, uh, and yeah, so devil is in the details, and and then legal for example is something very important, you know, like and it, it, don't need to be afraid of outsourcing as well. So uh, we have sporadic consultancy on legal. We are fortunate enough to be supported on the legal side by the investor company, but you know it's just enough. To to not make uh, a massive mistake, so it's just enough to 
to know to you know get our terms and conditions right get our contracts right get our business model right um and yeah that's the setup and then we started the period of building you know we created the company in september and from october to may um i being the, the only tech guy in the um, sorry me being the only tech guy in the in the company i'm responsible to build, to build in the platform more, more than anything and how 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 do I do it? You know, like how do I do it? Keep uh, with the studies on the side. How do I do it with my corporate job on the side? And uh, you know, I guess I came up with these points. Um, you know, traction over optimal business model. So I think Unilink was always based on very 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 early, um, very very early um, exploration and and market validation through 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 very simple dirt cheap solutions. And um, and with that, I mean that, you know, uh, OK, we had our Figma mockups and we have all these fancy things that we had at the beginning about like what the ideal development looks like. But, you know, I think especially for tech tech focused people, sometimes that is is a bad mistake because, you know, it's everything in your head, like how much of your business is actually uh, confirmed in real life. So we had very simple solutions that I'm going to show you in a, in, a, in a second that validated that that business. And then, um, OK, as you can see, validate features early. Aggressive time management, obviously being a part time, you know, being aggressive with time management means that sometimes you're going to lose some fun. Um, but I think the, the best thing I can tell you here is about is a story about like uh, my sport sportman years. Um, I was a swimmer and swimmers and people from athletics. We have this training period that, you know, even if you're an Olympic, uh, uh, if you're Olympic, for, uh, an Olympian, for example, you have a four year uh, period of training. And during that four year, you go to to a pit of of performance, so you are you are in a very tr high training load, and you can not really see uh, where you're living. You know, like you're just like your performance is not show is not showing what your what you're worth for a lot of, for a, lot, a long time, like six to one year, six months to one year, if you're an Olympian, and that means that you have to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And that's the thing about aggressive time management: you're sacrificing what um, some fun of today for the benefit of tomorrow. And plant sprints, hire talented friends. Yeah. I think that's very strat um, startup y, um, bootstrappy thing that I did was to, you know, I knew some friends in my course that were very good. One of them actually works in Microsoft right now. And um, and yeah, he, he, they helped me build. I hired them for a friendly price in a way. And, and they helped me build the first the first iteration of the of the application. And, and yeah, that's basically it. So yeah, this is another lesson. I just spoke about it a bit. No vacuum ideas, market validation before effort. And this is <laughs> this at, on the left. You can see what what our products are. The the app is already live. The first iteration that is a Figma mockup that is coming to reality soon. Actually, with a with a full rebuild of the app as well. And uh, but on the on the right, you can see what what it was in September. You know, we we had Google Forms and WhatsApp. And my my co-founder Andre is very inspired by the idea, by by the story. I think Airbnb that you know obviously they have a platform now, but at the beginning they were just knocking on doors. So that's what we did we were just knocking on doors as well and we still are in a way um hopefully one day we'll get out of it and uh, my second lesson is resources don't lie your motivation does have capacity in mind so i was always um an individualist i was always someone which, which was good at school and uh and I, I always thought i can do everything by myself um but but it's not really the case and and being part-time as well made me made me hit what marathonists call hitting the wall, right? You know, you're you're running for so long and then you cannot really push your productivity to the next level because, you know, you're actually at max capacity. And and I think capacity is, is the word of the year for me because now, you know, everything that I do is think of capacity, you know, like I may I may want to build the world, but, you know, if I don't have the resources to do it, I'm not going to go even halfway. Uh, so, yeah, May 24, first build was done. Um, with uh, some some sacrifice, not too much yet, and uh, and yeah, you know, uh, the, we focused on the use case that gave us the more mo the most money at the time, which is uh, part time jobs and one times. Not the only one for now, as I for the future, as I explained to you. Uh, we have some some traction, and we we are still focused on traction over business model, uh, and it's technically far from from perfect. I think it's very funny if I tell you some of the things that the the current app has. I'm not sure if I shouldn't be saying this, but there's no back office. You know, I publish, I publish jobs to, through scripts. Uh, obviously, there's no company side, so it's like it's literally half a platform. You know, it's running, but it's running on on humans behind it's the top AI. <laughs> and um, yeah, 
this is supposed to be a demo of the current app. Does it work? It does. Yeah. Just an interlude to breathe, I guess. It's only in Portuguese, yeah. For now, we want to target the problem that we started with, and then let's see. Yeah, yeah, I believe that. And and now I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about the second part, the unconventional part, which is uh, the plan of changing the law. You know, so how do you change the law? Uh, I think the um, that there's there's two paths in Portugal, at, th at least two paths that we vaguely identified. They both they both converge into going to parliament. But the fir the first uh, one is to bring a petition. So if you have 7,500 uh, signatures on a petition in Portugal, you are legally mandated to go to to parliament and discuss the issue. We did not get to that point. We got around three three k signatures. Uh, I admit we were a bit lazy with with finding signatures. Uh, physically, so we were just like putting it, putting it, putting it, putting it online. So what, what was happening was that we were getting a lot of likes and not a lot of signatures. Um, but yeah, so and in, but in the process, we 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 went to journals, we went to TV channels. Uh, it was a very interesting process, and it was actually a very good marketing. You know, it's like you you're having marketing for a noble cause, and at the end, you also have a business. So it's like, oh, by the way, we also do business with you. And then the second the second way to get to political um, to the parliament is to talk to with political parties. There's currently a socialist majority in Portugal, which means that any decision in the government needs to go um, through through the socialist party. And uh, and more specifically, there's two ways of passing the law. You have a proposal of resolution and a proposal of law. The law is passed immediately. The resolution is considered in the next next yearly budget, which is going to be in January and February. And if that goes through. Uh, we think so because it was proposed by the, the the majority party. So you know, I assume they are proposing something that they're going to pass later. Uh, if that happens, um, then you know, I'm, we're actually going to change the law before having a, a full fledged platform, which is not what I was thinking. And yeah, so you can see just some highlights, some TV, um, some TV highlights. You know, and on the top you can see the moment where they passed our resolution, our, our they passed our proposal to a proposal of resolution in the in the parliament and now um just to finish uh, journey sophomore year so second year um what what is the plan now onwards uh secure more funding we we applied for uh, some some more funding through a government grant still not a complete vc i still but a bit more formal than just asking money to an acquaintance company and with that money, we want to focus on rebuilding the platform. You know, I we want to correct everything that has been wrong so far, and uh, we want to build key metrics. You know, we, we are still again traction over business model. We we are very uh, selective with how we, we're getting money at the moment, but it's it's all it's all about giving value to the company. So, for example, in the jobs use case, we are we are charging per confirmed worker, so no, not not per job advertised. And uh, and yeah, we hope that can give us traction, and maybe in the future, AI helps us solving the problem that comes with uh, charging only per confirmed worker. Uh, and my last two lessons are: a management role is born is born out of necessity. Coming back to capacity, uh, I never wanted to be uh, a, a manager. I don't think I'm a manager in my full time in my full time uh, corporate job. I'm I'm a graduate engineer, and uh, but in a way here I had to become a manager because I need to. To get more people to build the platform, I, I need to, and I need to oversee them because I just hit the wall of productivity. And you know, how do I get to the next step? I guess I have to be a manager. And the last lesson is tech is a tool, not everything. Um, I think you know, obviously, uh, tech is very cool, but you know, we 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 are actually we we for our problems we managed to bring solutions. For example, the law thing, and that was not necessarily going through tech. So what I'm what I'm advocating here is to have the solution before the technology and not the opposite and then and then you know explore technologies obviously you know ai is here to stay for sure uh, but you know explore the technology and see if it fits your problem solving thank you questions of course
No, it's it's not legally forbidden. It's not legally forbidden. It's it's very there are there, there's a, um, a percentage of students who have um, who may choose to start working and lose benefits when they start working, but that doesn't mean it doesn't, it's not forbidden. It's exactly so it's like it's a very hard choice and a lot of people want to work, but they are not in a position to start working because of this. Hello. Yeah, I can tell your accent. Yeah. Lobbying. Yeah. Well, it. It's, you know, I think for for all the for all the fame that that uh, politicians have, I think we are actually heard more than we were thinking that we were going to be heard. So you know, we we kind of shot everywhere. You know. Any contact that we knew that was in any political party, we started asking like, OK, what can you do about this issue? This is really bad for young people. This is like bringing the age that they live, the, that they are financial independence higher and we can solve this. And we we and then we had a study from a, a university that proved some of these points like like, you know, they were proving that, you know, actually changing these laws was good. And, you know, so we just shot everywhere and then finally we were we were hurt. So it was a lot of meetings, a lot of calls, a lot of messaging. Uh, at the end of the day, that there's no other thing that I can. Exactly, because you know everyone wants to be tied with helping young young adults, right? And uh, and and students. You're welcome. Hello. Yeah, so 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 the 5000 is is uh, users in the platform and that does not uh, entail into into petition signups, you know, so. No, because we cannot we cannot if, if I come back to the terms and conditions, I can I can I don't want to just put in terms of conditions when you sign up to Unilinker, you're also signing the petition to change the law, you know, but it's in everybody's interest. It is, but for example, you need you need the full uh, identity card details when you to sign the petition, and this, this is not something that we require when there's a sign up for the platform. So there's a disparity, and you know we want to be very clear about what we are asking at each point in time as well. Yeah, but you know we could have been a bit more cunning in a way. Welcome. Uh, sorry. Thank you. Yes, yes, sir. Hello. Yeah, so um, coming back to the concept of capacity, uh, I think how many hours can I work in a day? Uh, how many hours can I work in a week? You know, if I want to do, if I want to target um, 60 hours a week, 70 hours a week, I know my job, I know my full time is 40, I have to do 30. <laughs> so it's like, okay, I will do three hours every day during work, work days, and then I'll do a full day of work on um, on Saturday, and then and then I'll rest a bit on Sunday, possibly. <laughs> You know, it's it's a. I try to be logical about it. You know, in practice, it's a bit messy sometimes. Yeah, yeah. You know. Cool. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. See, having such a journey like that is imperative to show you because you know when when it comes from sort of graduating university to moving into a graduate role to starting your company to Managing it all, like hats off to you. That is a uh, solid work uh, and really good effort. And lobbying a law, that's not so easy to do either. So if you're doing both or all three, super hard. So well done. Next up, we have got Dr. Krishna Duba. Duba? I hope I said that right. Yeah. Wonderful. And he's going to talk about decoding entrepreneurship in AI. So the highs and the lows of his journey and how you can maybe attain to it, avoid them, and have a bit of fun along the way. So I'm going to hand it straight over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Anna and his team uh, and her team uh, for inviting. <clears throat> so I'm Krishna Duba. Um, I had a 
um, I have two two startups. I started one uh, like last year, um, and then pivoted to the current one. Um, I mean, so this is all about you know like what, how can you sort and what are the problems we can face um, and to um, for starting something in AI. Uh, startup, you need to understand uh, the current status of uh, what's going on in AI, and it helps to even know what's the past and you know, how how we actually uh, got to this stage and what's going to be the next for AI. You know, because sometimes you want to start something where you want to catch the next wave, not the current one. So it's important to know where it is going, how it came to this uh, situation. And uh, I was very fortunate uh, to have like a front row uh, see to see how the AI progressed uh, during my PhD postdoc research um, and and I also had opportunity to see it from different views like academic research industry research and AI product development um, so that's the context like um, I have a um, academic research experience industry research experience and product develop experience um, I'm sorry <laughs> um, and so this helped me to, you know, like to see how we came to this spot and then what could be the next. Um, and also this helps you to whatever I tell, uh, should you take that or should you actually take the opposite of what I tell you? Because the context is very important. Uh, what worked for me might not work for you because of a different context. What might not have worked for me might work for you because of a different context. So, um, yeah, so I mean, um, I started AI before it was cool, um, so that's very. Uh, so I feel very old now. Um, so the my re first research was computer virus analysis using NLP. Again, this is like very very basic uh, NLP analysis. So this is like like um, long back, like fifteen years back. Um, then I moved to like um, I was really interested in AI, so I thought like okay, I'll come here for did a PhD. And um, so that was my PhD on basically uh, analyzing um, uh, event models in uh, in videos. Um, so this is with uh, Air France. Uh, so this is uh, so basically what you do is you have loads of the CCTV videos. You track these objects. Um, OK, so uh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, basically you track objects using computer vision um, uh, algorithms and then you track them and then from that you model what's going on in the video. And a uh, lot of companies are interested in it because they want to know what's is there abnormal events going on or they want to log the events uh, because if you have like thousands of CCTVs, you want to automate all these things. Um, Again, it's, it's important to know like the technology behind it. Uh, at that time, you hand engineer features. So you had all kinds of features, hawk features, color features, shift features, shift features. Um, so you uh, like the whole computer vision uh, or AI conferences were filled with people like engineering these different uh, features and you take you change the data set the features don't work you have to come up with new features because they used a different camera um so and um, um so that that's how everything started uh, and it's funny when jan likun uh, so one of the godfather of ai when he wrote a paper for a computer vision conference on oh let's do end to end you don't engineer features let's learn them and then they rejected his paper uh because it's very new, like, no, you don't do that. Like you don't learn features, you engineer them. So yeah, even in research, you don't like new ideas. Um, then he has to say, give it to ML conference. Now you try the opposite, they'll reject your paper. No, you don't engineer features. You have to learn them because that's how you do it. Um, um, so it's an important lesson, like um, sometimes, new ideas are not encouraged but um, um, yeah you just push them and uh, see where it goes um and then i moved on to um, um, uh, robotics um, again it's the same problem now instead of fixed cameras you have a moving camera where you have a uh, it's, it's on the on the robot and it's trying to be a intelligent waiter so we were training it to be an intelligent waiter um I mean, one thing here you have to observe is like this is like a decade ago, um, and at the time the chatbots were mediocre, and the robot was mediocre, 
But look at now that chatbots are amazing, like mind blowing. And where are the robots? Well, we are still kind of almost not that much progress. So it's also important to understand what progresses fast and what doesn't and what's a hard problem and what's a not an easy problem, but you know what can be an easy problem. Uh, that's very hard to find in AI because uh, uh, things that are easy for us might be very hard for a computer and that are hard for us might be very easy for a computer or for AI. Um, and this is, I think there is even a paradox. I think it's called, it starts with an M, a Martel paradox or something like. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a, like a, every project like taught me all these, uh, you know, like uh, insights. Um, yeah, and again, um, so this is um, uh, another one very similar, um, but now we are dealing with humans in, uh, in videos. And this was a DARPA project. So it was done as part of consortium. It was supposed to go for five years. They canceled it in two years because we, uh, the the the, con um, the community didn't make any good um, uh, progress. The problem was you were trying to learn event models, but the building blocks of object detection and tracking were not good. So then you can't really learn the high level stuff when your building blocks were very bad. Um, so they scrapped it and they like, okay, it's, this is not the time to do this project, so we'll come back to it later. Um, then I moved to industry research. So yeah, like a lot of papers, and then uh, this is in uh, Nokia research. So um, I don't know if you know, this is called Nokia Ozo camera. Uh, it costs around $50,000. So basically what it captures is a 360 degree um, thing. And it was amazing to, to see what it can do. Um, but um, what it this taught me is that timing is everything. When they released it, the ecosystem was not there. You know, the the, the headsets they were not good. Uh, you, they were there. I think Oculus was there, but it caused a lot of nausea. Um, so the ecosystem was not there, and uh, um, it you know if you have not heard of it, it means it it obviously failed. Um, so. Uh, it's very important to 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 know. The, I mean, it's it's hard to guess whether the ecosystem will go forward or not uh, because there are a lot of factors in it. Uh, I think they took a gamble and uh, it didn't work. Um, and yeah, so and uh, I moved on to Bell Labs where we we're doing uh, explainable AI using um, knowledge graphs. Um, so it's here you're trying to um, you know combine two things and. Uh, um, um, yeah, like knowledge graphs and deep learning. Um, so this is where we started to get, uh, uh, I started to get into deep learning. And then um, after research, I moved to, uh, so uh, I thought, okay, maybe I should I should try something like a product development and move to um, Blue Prism. Uh, here we developed, a, so uh, called Blue Prism Capture. It's something like a apprentice where you know like it's looking at your screen what you're doing and then it builds a model and then you say oh can you do it again and then it does it it's almost like you're training an apprentice um so yeah that's where i quit my job and then started uh, something called gvai so it's a uh, um a ai powered obviously um uh well-being uh, app um where it it, it 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 acts as like a personal uh, digital personal coach, uh, trying to see where the gaps are in your life uh, and try to uh, recommend activities so you can you can have a well balanced life. Um, we released it in uh, uh, App Store, Google Store. We had like around twenty five thousand downloads, um, at a um, lot of users, uh, but unfortunately we couldn't uh, generate enough revenue, so we had to decide, OK, let's pivot. Uh, and as part of this, uh, it has chatbots, so you can you will have like six chatbots. Like there is a one chatbot for physical health, one for hobbies and you know, like these kind of different chatbots. And um, we were using uh, uh, the traditional bot development frameworks or we used Rasa. Then move, we moved on to LLMs uh, and that's where we salvage that technology and then um, moved on to the next one called A2O AI. So in A2O AI, uh, it's a recent one, um, around five months. So here we are developing um, um, a virtual data scientist for enterprise 
customers. Well, it had two pro uh, two products. Uh, Corpus. Um, I think you might have uh, Darshana in, in in her talk. You, you might have seen all these. Uh, what it what it does. Basically, you give uh, documents, and then you can ask all kinds of questions. Um, then we had another product called Insight. Um, so Corpus is for unstructured data. So and uh, Insight is for structured data. So you give all kinds of structured data, and then you can ask all kinds of the data science questions, and then it can answer with uh, uh, tables, charts, and uh, all kinds of interactive things. <clears throat> so again, yeah, it's 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 up there. Console.a2o.ai. You can give it a try. Uh, it's free. You can uh, uh, free version is there. Um, so, okay, I can see it here. Okay, yeah. Um, so the vision is actually to have uh, what we call A2O Com. Um, so it's a causal AI uh, plus LLM. Um, so where it can answer descriptive, predictive, and causal queries and takes everything into your the whole enterprise data into consideration. I'll come to the causal AI thing. So that's that's the vision and we are trying to catch the next wave, uh, which is basically causal AI um, and using LLM. So yeah, that's that's my journey where, you know, like yeah, coming up uh, from like a PhD and a lot of research and uh, and the and the startups. Um, and so from here, I'll I'll tell you some few things that I learned uh, running a running a sort of like you know pivoting um, and going through the process of trying to get customers and dealing with the co-founders uh, and others. Um, like a chess game, you have three stages. So one is opening, middle game, and end game. Any blunders you make in opening, it's game over. You don't have a middle game or end game. Like yeah, so so you got to be very careful there. Um, so in opening, I mean, you don't even have to start a company like this is like a trend that I'm observing now. Uh, it's basically you you start with something like a humble open source library, uh, Langchain, Llama Index, Pandas AI, like LLM. I mean, if you might have heard of these if you're into LLMs, um, they all started as very simple open source libraries. Now they have a few million funding. So this might be one approach you can take if you're a part-time student uh, you know trying to come up like you know just just start something open source and uh, see how it goes uh, <clears throat> um again you know like yeah use all available resources and microsoft wonders hub or a SaaS based product they're giving you free credits um yeah local no code frameworks are there you don't need to be uh, this one man can run the show um so yeah go go for it um Again, try to resist chasing trends. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's like whether it's across the fields or within the fields, like, oh, yeah, crypto was the great right now. Now let's, let's get down. Let's go to AI. Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, that's how I feel like, you know, try something with passion uh, and stick to it. Um, I mean, I've been there in AI and I really loved the end goal of AI. So whether it works, whether it will be cool in the next five years or not, I, I don't care. Like I want to be in AI and I'll be in AI. Um, so I mean, try to have that because that's very important. Startup is a very hard task and you need to be really, really passionate to be there. And also like, you know, if you want to catch the next wave, and if you think you miss the LLM wave, uh, you can try to catch the next wave. Uh, so this is my guess. Um, like cognitive architectures with LLM, that's going to be the next big thing because there are a lot of problems with the current LLMs. I mean, this this talk uh, he explains very nicely, Tom Detrich. Um, as I mentioned, causal AI and LLM is what we are trying to trying to look at. Uh, I think the next wave of machine learning will be causal AI. The reason is uh, ML is all correlation based uh, and it is not very accurate. Uh, so people has to move to causal AI um, and LLMs will help with that because for causal AI, you need a lot of domain knowledge, uh, encoding of DAGs and, and all kinds of things and LLM will help with that. So which means there is no reason why you don't want to go to causal AI. So probably two, two to four years, uh, you're gonna see that in the in data science um, and multi-agent systems. So again, these were had a lot of problems with um, language now that LLMs are solving it a little bit, so they're gonna uh, come again. All these things. Um, 
And again, uh, when you're trying to, um, you know, I think people, a lot of people will tell you, okay, you need to have a mod, differentiation, tech stack is important. Customers don't care, maybe investors care. Um, so, and I would lean towards customers fast. Um, so uh, just, just build something for customer and don't care about this. Once you have some traction, then you can look at, okay, well, how can I build a mod or what should be my differentiation? Or, okay, should I use Python or Rust? Or PHP is okay. Um, so yeah, you can worry about those later. So okay, now, Iman, okay, you started, and now you're in the middle game. Um, uh, one of the important thing is like you know holding the team together, um, like your whether it's a co-founder team or uh, or others. Uh, be aware of these biases that you will have. Uh, we call it contribution estimation bias. Like I think this works even for in a corporate world, you know, where you overestimate your contribution while you underestimate others. And so uh, this this is a classic study where you, they ask you how much do you think you contribute, how much do you think your colleagues or partners contribute, and then you say oh, I contribute sixty, and the others contribute forty, and then you add up, it doesn't work. Or 100. So, so be aware of that bias and let others also be aware of that bias. Um, and also the importance estimation bias, like you overestimate the importance of your department and underestimate the others. Um, for me, I think uh, everything is important. Maybe there's a timing difference, but uh, but everything is important and everything is hard. Um, just looking at a pro doing something easy um, doesn't make it like oh that's easy, but uh, you know like you're looking at a pro doing it in a, in a you know, easy way. So so always keep that in mind. Every every department work is hard. Um, so I mean if you have these like you know you you won't have this kind of uh, tech pro culture or you know like those kind of things. Um, and um, so stop the autopilot mode. So what I mean by is like. Um, uh, I think this also works in your job. Uh, it's it's a very you spend a lot of nights, um, you know, like burning midnight oil, um, uh, always thinking about your startup. Um, so what happens is you go in an autopilot mode, um, so which is uh, very dangerous. And you you do it, but be conscious of it. Oh, I'm not sleeping well. It's fine. Just just keep that in mind that okay, you're not sleeping or you're not. Uh, uh, meeting your, um, you know, spending time with your family. Do do it consciously. That way, you know. Oh, okay, there is a problem. I need to find a solution. Maybe I'll find it next month. Or, but if you do in autopilot mode, you might be like six months down the line. Then you don't know you that you have had this problem, and it can have a serious irreparable uh, damages. So always do some uh, the you know like everything consciously. Um, again, interact with people. Um, yeah, so um, I mean, I I did uh, GBI, which is for well-being. That's where I got all this, you know, like I read all this uh, research, and and these problems are very, uh, very high with startup founders uh, because the, the 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 stress and the the problem is hard, and uh, you know, like everything is very difficult, and you're alone um, doing it because it's a very small team. You don't have help from HR department because there is no HR department. Um, so so big and you don't have money, a lot of money to like you know have a, a consultation or anything. So 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 yeah. Um, so be uh, take care of yourself. There are a lot of forums. Join them. If you need help, don't uh, just just ask. Uh, yeah. uh, there's a saying in my mother tongue like if you don't ask, even your mother won't serve you. So so just ask. Uh, and there are some uh, especially, I don't know. Yeah, anonymous founders group in Slack. That's an amazing one. I mean, I was surprised how these founders have so much time helping other anonymous founders. And you just ask anything they're going to they'll help you with. Um, so, yeah, the end game. Don't get too, too attached to your idea. Uh, it's it's OK to quit. Um, think of quitting in terms of gambling, right? In gambling, when you quit, you're not losing. You're actually gaining the money you have in your pocket or the time you left. It. So so it's okay to, you know, like uh, to let go of your idea, move on, pivot to something. I mean, there's, uh, again, it's a very confusing thing. Like, okay, a lot of successful people have great, like great is basically pushing against overwhelming odds. But, um, 
my take is uh, stop it when the when the fund stops. Um, so yeah, and also acknowledge luck because uh, if everything works out, you can stay humble. And if it doesn't work, uh, maybe it's not your fault. It's just your bad luck. So you can try again. Um, um, and I think there is a, even a, like a book on it, like you know how much luck plays a role in uh, in founders and um, and success. Uh, it's just people don't don't acknowledge it. And finally, that's uh, that's my desktop uh, background. Um, so it's called the Man in the Arena, Theodore Roosevelt. A lot of people will criticize you. They say, "I told you so." You know, you're gonna fail, uh, but it's okay. Uh, you know, like uh, um, yeah, you you either win or you learn. Um, so yeah, go for it. Um, I think yeah, that's that's my team uh, who are with me along the along the ride. Um, yeah, and that's it. Uh, thank you. Time for maybe one or two questions. If anybody has one, gone. <clears throat> Yeah, I must send back into Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I went to the movie The Matrix. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's how I really got fascinated by it. I think the way I see is I look at I looked at the end goal of uh, topics. Like, let's say I did my bachelor's in computer science. I had like 40 topics like computer networks and databases. And what's the end goal of each dot topic? For me, the end goal of AI was so fascinating. Like, I mean, you see, the, the, there's no difference between this computer and the table, but making this non living thing think, reason, and ponder that's mind blowing. And I didn't see that kind of end goal of that. I mean, no offense to any other <laughs> department that I know. But for me personally, I didn't feel that for any other topic. So I was like, okay, this this is this is what I'm gonna pursue. So that's how I got into this. And yeah, it's a, it's a it's a wonderful uh, topic. Um, in in AI space, um, so Gary Marcus, um, so that's um, Gary Marcus and uh, um, Jeff Hinton um, and uh, Benjio. So, I mean Gary Marcus because I kind of lean towards his philosophy. Basically, what he says is uh, the okay. Uh, there are two schools of thought in AI. So one is connect, connectionist approach, um, where you have neural networks, and the other is good old-fashioned AI. Uh, and then they are all fighting. Uh, there were, yeah, there. You have to see uh, the the Twitter wars between Jan Lee Kuhn and uh, um, and Gary Marcus, and you can see you know, like all like. But yeah, uh, so those are, uh, uh, and and I think that that's the future where you need to have hybrid hybrid models for. If you if you are looking for AGI, you know, like you need a connectionist approach doesn't fit, uh, not enough, you know. That, that, that's that's my own uh, opinion as well. Um, One more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with the, the, the Robert needs to have. I presume with his chicken hand, he can't hold paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I think it's it's just uh, I, you you don't need uh, to hold or do anything right. Like you just have to do some uh, 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 gestures to to play that game. Um, oh yes. Yeah, yeah. But 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 they might have a different way of playing it because they're robots, so they they might just play by telepathy. <laughs> yeah, I think I mean one fascinating thing is like the common sense. Um, I think this is what uh, I observed when I was doing that that robotics where you're designing this waiter, a robot waiter, and it was so hard, like such a simple thing. You 
you you really have to work hard to get the robot to understand like okay just just putting a cup on the table or uh, you know just to understand that you can't reverse the cup when there is liquid in it but it's okay to reverse it when there is nothing in it so everything becomes so hard which is so easy for us you don't need to be like you know just common sense right and um, it's so fascinating, like, you know, like some, uh, that's why I mentioned, like, you know, some things that are easy for us are so hard for a computer. Um, and and it that even makes it harder because now, because it's easy, you don't encode anything anywhere. Uh, so it's it's hard for the computer to learn it. Um, um, so, yeah, uh, common sense is one, like the final frontier, or at least from my, from my point of view, where you crack it, you don't, if you don't crack it, you don't get AGI or it. Good. All those questions there. If you have any more questions, come and grab them at the end. Um, round of applause. Cool, please. Thank you. So I think there's some really important lessons that Dr. Krishna really spoke about there. Knowing when to quit is one that I'm going to take away. Not that I'm quitting my job, but knowing when to quit and say no also goes along with that one. Uh, so that's also really important. And of course, building for your customers first, I think is also a really good point that he touched on because ultimately who's going to make your business a success, right? Your customers, your users, they're the ones bringing in the money outside of investment. So massive thank you to that. Now, next up, we have got Anne Claire, who lives and breathes Microsoft for startups. So she's going to take you through Founders Hub, what it is, how you can get started and some of the benefits that it provides. Over to you. Thank you, Liam. Thank you. So um, hopefully I will took uh, five minutes of your time to present to Microsoft for Startups. Um, so I'm Anne Claire Bianco. I'm part of the Microsoft for Startup team uh, and I've been at Microsoft for five years. Um, and I just want to say a thank you to Thomas and Krishna for their uh, presentation today. Uh, that's very inspiring and that's why I, I love my job is uh, people like, uh, like you. <laughs> So what it is, Microsoft for Startups. So we have a platform called Founders Hub, and we are really trying to make sure that every founder can build their project and their business through our platform. So whether it's as accessing to technical tools, technical support um, and uh, expert guidance and Founders Hub is open to all. Um, so whether, depending on your maturity, so whether you have an ID, um, so you are prototyping, uh, you can have an MVP already, you can have customer traction, or you have found product market fit, uh, you will be allocated into one of these uh, levels. So ideate, develop, grow, and scale. Um, so really, Founders Hub is trying to help um, a founder from ideation to exit. Um, so let's say you're going to start in uh, ideation, so you will get Azure credits, LinkedIn benefits, uh, and tools really to experiment your, your ID. So really the level is kind of the, 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 the first level is the first step to get into all of the amazing benefits uh, with the, all of the logos that you can see on the slides. Um, and as long as you have activated your Azure credits, so you start you know building um, your product or service and you have uh, incorporated your business then you can go into the next le next level uh, which is called develop and here really you're gonna really start uh, interacting with people so what uh, krishna was saying um, funding a company is very uh, an alone space but we are trying to make sure that you will be connected to technical support and business related uh, experts um, and i'm going to talk about that um, in a second you're going to be able to um, have access to our amazing GitHub uh, community. Um, then on the grow level, Mercury, Stripe, if you want to set up, you know, payment solution, um, Unserada, they can help you, um, you know, with um, accessing and creating data room, uh, data for compliance and, and security, so, and so on and so on. And everything, all of those benefits, they are accessible onto our platform. Um, just to give you an idea, so let's say you, going to start ideation, you will have four years with us because every level is one year. So the, the second uh, level develop, you will have three years, grow two years and scale, you have two years with us. So that's the platform when you can get all of the benefits. And on the develop uh, section, you can see your Azure consumption and you can have access uh, to our engineering team. So the technical people 
from Microsoft who are able to uh, to support you with um, your technical challenges. And this team is called Asia Pairing. So whether you want to get started on Asia, whether you want to have an architecture review, migrate, being multi-cloud, you will go into this uh, develop tab. You will uh, fill it in a little form for us to understand what it is your technical uh, challenges, and you will have a one-to-one -one session with um, one of our technical experts. And then something as well uh, amazing is we have uh, what we call an expert network. So again, on the on the platform, let's say you have a business uh, challenge and you want to, to solve it. Um, you don't have anyone on LinkedIn to uh, to be in touch with. You don't know how to start with. So you will be able to go and find a sub. Uh, you go into the expert network and you type on the on the search uh, a keyword and you will have a list uh, of uh, of experts that you can talk to. To refine your research, you can uh, find by region, by industry, language, um, and again, you will have a list based on what you have uh, put on the search bar. So you can uh, have um, people who will be able to help with ID validation. Um, in the UK, I'm trying to help with uh, investment uh, and fundraising support on how to, to set up your, your thinking towards that. Um, you have folks who are experts in business plan, um, product roadmap, and also how to partner with Microsoft. Um, I have put some example on the slide. So for instance, Miha, uh, he's based in the US, but he's also a serial, a serial entrepreneur. Um, his last startup has been exited, and you can have a one one session with him. We have industry experts uh, like Sally and Kirsten and um, ultimately Azure OpenAI and um, Azure uh, and OpenAI uh, folks who can uh, help you with your uh, question related to AI. So again, to summarize, uh, if you were to go through our program, we will give you up to 150,000 of uh, cloud credits. On top of that, for OpenAI, you receive 2,500 credits. Um, you have um, access from level two to technical uh, folks um, to help you, as well as experts for the, the business-related business, business related question. And then all of the tools that you have seen on, on the slides um, that, that are coming from Microsoft, but also third-party partners. So if you want to open to our uh, if you want to apply sorry for our program you will go to our website um eligibility criteria are quite simple you will need to be willing to um uh, build a cloud based product or service uh you have not received uh, more than 10000 uh, azure credits in the past um and your business will be uh, for for profit um you will have to have a LinkedIn profile. Um, so we are asking you basic questions about your ID um, or your startup um, currently, and then what was the stage of your company, really to try to understand which level you will be uh, allocated um, to make sure that we are supporting you uh, at the right time, at the right stage. Yeah. And if you want to apply, there is this QR code, um, but also happy to answer any questions and you can um, also um, add me on LinkedIn if you have uh, further question after the event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne Claire. So Founders Hub is a phenomenal program that we're running at Microsoft because it allows you to literally get one-to-one -one help with us, right? Well, who doesn't want free credits? Who doesn't want the help? Who doesn't want that sort of that rubber duck to bounce ideas off of? So that's a really good idea. You know, you don't need to have a business by any means. Like you don't need to have a business to start. An idea is enough. And that's level number one. Like you said, it's the ideation stage. So thank you very much, Anne Claire. If you have any questions, come and grab us uh, after this because this is literally the end now. And with that, what is up next? So I mentioned at the beginning, Microsoft Ignite. So that's going to be a really fun event. There's going to be some really cool announcements and I'm super excited for it. So I hope you are too. GitHub Universe Cloud Skill Challenge. Like I said earlier, if you missed the QR code, now's the chance to scan it. A uh, really good way to get hands on with AI Copilot and our learn modules in Microsoft. So I know a couple of people that worked on the content and it is just amazing. Uh, I'm going to be doing it myself as well. And uh, it's a bit of friendly competition. Who doesn't like that? So it kicks off in about three days. So make sure you sign up. When you go on there, there's a little button. Take it. Have a bit of fun. A bit of friendly competition. Wait for you to put your phones down. There we go. Ready, steady, and we're moving on. And I can get your friends out again. So if you want resources, um, you can scan this QR code or go to link aka.ms forward slash build your startup resources. This has got everything. So if you want to Cloud Skill Challenge, if you want to register for Ignite, if you want to get in contact with any of the speakers today, 
then our contact details are on this post. And with that being said, I want to say a massive thank you to all of our speakers that gave their time this evening. And a massive thank you to all of you who are joining online, albeit with all the te uh, technical hiccups, and everybody in person as well. It's a great uh, honor to be able to run these events for you to help provide you know, the cool stuff and show you what we do here at Microsoft. So massive thank you for being patient. And uh, you have got 15, 20-ish minutes to network and have a bit of fun. Thank you very much. Thank you.